Hi everyone, welcome to today's project. My name is Haya. I am a teaching artist with Youth Art Exchange, a nonprofit providing programs for young artists here in the San Francisco area. I'm so happy to be a part of Walt Disney Family Museum's virtual workshops and share this project with you all. In this workshop, we will be creating mix and match marionettes. Here's another example. As you can see, they are assembled from the different body parts of found images. Think Frankenstein meets paper dolls. And here's another example. It's a different version. Oops, she got tangled up there. I will also be showing you how to create these articulated pieces so your marionette can move. A marionette is often described as a puppet figure with jointed limbs that can be moved with string or wire. Marionette is a French word meaning little Mary. Its origin is believed to be derived from France during the Middle Ages when string puppets were used to portray religious stories. A prominent character in these depictions the Virgin Mary was one of the first marionettes, and the name stuck. There are different styles of marionettes that range from simple to complex. Sicilian puppets, which are made from wood, have a vertical rod handle running through the body. Burmese marionettes are only string operated and are more complicated, requiring a single expert puppeteer to control as many as 18 wires or strings. Traditionally, these puppets are used in opera performances. The jointed puppets we will be creating today are made using paper collaging techniques. Here are some examples by students from past workshops. These are the materials you'll need for today's project. Card stock, scissors and glue stick, an awl and a needle or nail, wooden sticks, a ruler, tape, fine string or thread, markers, rubber bands, and small metal fasteners. Most importantly, found images of people, animals, or any beings with body parts. You can find and collect these pictures from old magazines, calendars, greeting cards, and postcards, even mailing ads. Or you can find them from discarded books. The first thing you'll want to do is go through your stash of gathered print material and find interesting pictures of animals, people, or any type of being with anatomical parts. When selecting your images, try to find different kinds of body parts like heads, torsos, limbs, tails, etc., and several within each category. The more variety you have, the more combinations you'll be able to preview. <laughs> Keep in mind that prints that have a stiffer thickness, such as this greeting card and this old picture calendar, work best. And then this image I found in an old art magazine. 
and it's made out of paper stock or card stock, so this would work out really well. And then this I cut out from an old um, stencil book, and again, it, it's made out of card stock, so stiff paper always works best for your marionette. If you find an image you would like to use, but it's too flimsy, you could always reinforce it with a card stock backing. All you would need to do is take your image and glue it onto a card stock backing with your glue stick and then cut around it. Sometimes clothing alone can represent a body part. For example, I found this baby onesie in a magazine, and I think it would make a fine torso for your marionette. Here are pictures from clothing catalogs that can substitute for actual body parts. These women's tunics and this onesie can serve as a torso, and these sneakers can be used as feet. Once you've chosen several images you'd like to use, cut around the outline of the desired piece, but leave enough extra space in the neck or joint area so that you can overlap the adjoining pieces together. Here too, with the torso, you wanna create a neck or leave enough space for a neck so you can attach your other piece on. If you like, you have the option to design your own custom body part. On this one, I created a mermaid tail for my marionette and a skirt made out of tissue paper and then the rest is from found images. Go ahead and use this time if you'd like to create a custom piece. I've decided to make this German Shepherd a pair of wings. After you have cut out all your pieces, you're now ready to lay them out and start assembling your marionette.
Next, decide which body parts are going to be articulated and which ones will not be moving. Go ahead and position the non-moving pieces where you'd like them to be. So I think um, I would like my legs, these skinny legs, to be positioned right there and I don't want them to move or I don't want them to be articulated. Um, I think I want to articulate this hand, this arm, and this arm, and then maybe this wing. And the head I think I'll have the head stay still and have this arm articulating, the wings articulating, and this arm to stay still. So go ahead and the parts you want to stay still, go ahead and glue them on with your glue stick. So that was going to be uh, these three. So you can decide whether you want to glue them in front of your um, piece or behind it. I think this one looks better behind it. Okay, so I think I will glue these now on. Oops. And then I'm going to take this one and glue it behind. So do it that way. And then I think I said the head um, I'll have stationary. Now this is a little flimsy again, so I'm going to reinforce it with some uh, backing. So again, you can use any scrap um, card stock. This is from an old folder. You can use an old cereal box. It doesn't have to be anything that you purchase. Um, just whatever you can find around the house that's scrap um, uh, card stock. Remember also to leave enough space where you want to stick your piece on. Um, in this case, it's gonna go in front of the shirt. So it kind of looks like the shark is wearing um, the onesie. And then, um, yeah, just make sure you have enough room for attachment. Okay, so now I want to, oh, I wanted to, I don't know, do I want this moving? Hmm. Uh, no, I think I'll have it stationary. Okay, so I have my piece 
so far with, these all will remain stationary, so I've glued them all down with my glue stick. And now I'm going to show you how to attach the parts that are articul articulated or moving. So to attach a moving body part, mark a point on the torso where to hinge the moving piece, usually in a location where a person or an animal would naturally bend, rotate, or swivel, like at the neck, joint, waist, like at the uh, neck, any joint or the waist. So in this case, I'm gonna make a mark right here. Kind of positioned how you want it. And I'm gonna make my mark right about there. and that's where the joint will be hinged. And then for the wings, I'll just position them this way. So I think I wanted this wing to move, this wing to stay still, and this one to be hinged. So you'll make your, I'll make, I want this wing to be in back, but I still want to make the hinge right here. Right about even with that location. So right about there. And you can test it to see how it'll move by holding it and moving it around this wing, I'm going to just glue down. To punch a hole in your piece, um, I'm gonna use this hole punch. And as you can see, it has a very small hole. It's not like um, the ones with a big hole punch. So if you can see that, that's the size of the hole. I'm gonna use that, but you can also, if you don't have a hole punch um, that's this small, you can also use an awl or a nail and needle to make a hole. So any of these um, tools will be fine to use. Um, I'll demonstrate how to do how to use both of them. After you've marked the two places where your um, body part will be hinged, place the body part, overlap it with the torso or wherever it's going to be adjoined. And then just kind of press down and move your piece the way you'd like it to move. So I think I'd like it. That looks about right. So I'm going to hold it and then I'm going to take my small hole punch and just punch it right through that center where I marked it. Like that. And then you'll take a metal brad. Um, I'm using these small ones. Here, I'll show you one that you could see better. Um, and I'm going to put it right through 
the front of my piece where I've made the hole. And actually, I'm going to take my awl. You could also use just a sharp pencil and just kind of make it big enough so it doesn't get stuck in there. So I'll take my brad, push it through, and then on the other side, there are these two legs that you're gonna split and open up like that to secure it in the back. And here's what it looks like from the back, the metal brad, and then in the front. And then just sort of push it down on so it's nice and firm. But and there you have an articulated piece. So I'm going to go ahead and do the other side with the wing that I've chosen. And again, I think I want it in the back of my piece. So. Again, just hold it down and see the range of how much, where you want to move the, um, your moving piece. So I think that's good right there. So this time I'll demonstrate with an awl, or if you don't have that with a nail, works just as well. And I'm gonna put something in the back to protect, um, my tabletop here. Okay, so I'm going to use this nail to pierce through, and I just put a little protective cardboard underneath um, so you don't damage your surface. You could use a, a cutting board or just a piece of cardboard like this is fine. So I'm just gonna make sure, make sure that when you put it through, it is actually going through this piece as well. So I think I'll have it like that. That looks about right. And I'm just going to take my nail and pierce it through like this. Just work it through. Be careful not to poke yourself. And that works pretty well. I'm gonna take my thick needle and just make sure. That's a nice big opening. And then take my other brad and just push it through. Like this. Make sure it, it does go through your piece back here. Um, and then you just wanna open it up. The legs open up like that. And there's my second moving piece. So this arm, this wing are my articulated pieces for my marionette. And I've just, whoops, glued the legs and one of the arms and his head um, right on the piece. So those will remain stationary. So now you can see the pieces are all set. After you have completed assembling your piece and attached the moving parts, the next step is to add a handle. I will be showing you three different ways to attach your puppet to a stick. The first version is a stick puppet. It's the easiest and most basic of the three. 
So here's a demonstration of a stick puppet, and I will show you how to make, how to put the stick on to your stick puppet. This is the first version. So just simply turn your puppet over and grab a stick. Um, a barbecue skewer works well or a chopstick, uh, wooden chopsticks, um, depending on the size of your puppet. Um, so just put it flat, face down on the table or a flat surface and put your stick about at least halfway across um, your puppet with enough um, room at the bottom to hold com to hold comfortably as a handle. So I think um, probably it's about halfway. That's about, so just position it like that and then take some tape and hold it down and put it, put the tape probably like two or three places just to make sure it's secure, especially here at the top and at the bottom. Maybe you can put one more in the middle. Make sure it's secure. And then there you have it. This is the stick version. You can hold it here at the bottom. And, and then for the stick puppet, you can manually position your poses. This second version allows your puppet to dangle from a string. First, cut a piece of string about 12 inches long. Next, take your stick and we're going to score one end, one tip, we're going to score it with scissors. This will help the string from not slipping off the edge. So you'll take your scissors and maybe about half inch to a quarter inch from the tip. Score with your scissors by cutting very carefully around. Just to make a notch. Be careful not to cut all the way through. Just cut and twist. Till you have a little bit of a notch. Cut and twirl your stick. You have a little bit of a notch there.
Next, take one end of the string and tie it onto the notch. The easiest way is to tie a loose loop first, like this. Then put your stick through, line it up with the notch, and tie it on like that. Now you can tie it in a knot so it stays secure. Now it'll help keep the string from sliding off. Take your puppet and line it up with your stick and string pulled straight. An ideal length is maybe six inches. So mark a hole, make a mark where that will be. Have it in the center of your puppet's head or at the top of your puppet. So that's about right here. Now poke a hole where you've marked the spot. And take the end of the thread you can use a needle. For easy threading. Put it through your puppet. And then tie a knot. It's easy to tie it when you have it on a, a needle. Oh, it came out, okay. So you have your, and tie it a second time to secure it. And make sure you're maintaining the six inch length that you intended to have, so this is okay. It's about seven, but that's all right. You can trim the excess string if you want. And there you have it. The last version I'll be demonstrating is a little more complicated, but resembles the style of a traditional marionette. First, you'll need to construct a T-shaped handle. These are the materials you'll need. Two long wooden sticks measuring between 10 to 12 inches, a small stick about four and a half inches, two pieces of string 14 inches in length approximately, masking tape, and a rubber band. Take one of the long sticks and tape it to the back of your puppet as demonstrated in the stick puppet version.
To construct your tea stick, you'll take one of your longer sticks and your shorter stick and make a tea with it. Hold it in the cross section so that both ends of the small stick are even. Next, take your rubber band and wrap it around accordingly, one side and the next side, alternating between the two. until it's fit pretty snugly on. Next, you'll want to score some notches on either end of the small stick, just like you did on the stick in version two. So take your scissors, and just slightly score around until you get a little notch. Same on the other side. Again, be careful not to cut right through. This will help the string from sliding off. Tie one end of each string to the smaller stick on either side. Again, it's easiest to first tie a loop and then slip it over the stick. Place it where the notch is so that it won't slide off the stick. Tie a second knot to secure it and pull it tightly. Do the same on the other side. Lay your puppet face up and position it so that the strings run down to its limbs where you're going to attach them to. Position the moving pieces face down, facing down. And I went ahead and marked some holes where you're going to attach the string through. Go ahead and do that with a pen. And take your needle and punch a hole in it. Take your awl or a pencil to make the hole bigger if you like. Now take one end of the string, and thread it through the needle. It'll be easier to tie to your piece.
Leave it loose for now. Go ahead and do it on the other side. Now put the hands down position, the arms down, and adjust the length of the string from the teeth handle to the point where you've threaded it through your puppet. Make sure that the lines are taut and parallel to one another. This is important so that it's even on both sides. So go ahead and adjust that. A good measurement between puppet and stick is about seven inches, six or seven inches. So go ahead and take some tape and just place it down. Trying not to move the strings. Keeping them taut and parallel. And then tie them off on either side. I'm going to re-thread my needle again. So it's easier to tie. And try not to move your limbs, just keep them down. Make sure when you tie it, it's nice and taut. Okay, do the same on the other side. Again, make sure the lengths are, are the same and that it's pulled taut when you tie it. That looks about good. Now you can tie off cut off the extra string if you wish. And remove the tape. Thank you for joining me in this mix and match marionette workshop. I had a lot of fun and I hope you did too.
Welcome and hello everyone. My name is Jenna and I'm the school assistant and I'm part of the education team at the Walt Disney Family Museum. We're so excited to have you join us for our segment of the Big Green Draw 2020, A Climate of Change. In our portion of the Big Draw, we will be going over how Walt Disney envisioned a better future for our planet through his plans of Epcot and the ways in which we can continue Walt's vision and our own vision of an ideal future for our planet and for humanity. We're so excited to have you join us today to learn some exciting facts, but also do some fun activities as well. We want you to take a moment to imagine our planet Earth. Think about all of the things you like about it. Do you love going into the ocean? Do you like animals? Are you interested in hiking or going outside? Think about all these aspects of Earth that make you happy. And just like you may protect some of the things you love at home, like maybe your siblings or your favorite toy, or maybe even your pet, that's our job to also protect the things on Earth that make us happy. Let's start with learning about the word sustainable. You may have heard this word before, or maybe you haven't. But when people say we need to make our lives on Earth sustainable, what they really mean is we need to protect our Earth and make sure humans can live on it for as long as possible. Making sure something is sustainable is making sure something can last a long time while also being safe for our planet. But why is this something we need to think about? Well, just like how money doesn't actually grow on trees. We have limited resources here on Earth to produce energy for the things that we love, like the internet, TV, cars, and other forms of technology. But there are things that we can do so that we don't use up all of our resources. The resources we tend to use to produce our energy are oil, natural gas, and coal. These are known as fossil fuels. There were two reasons why fossil fuels aren't sustainable. One, we don't have an unlimited source of these types of energy. Oil will eventually run out, as well as coal. Two, when we burn coal, gas, and oil, we release harmful chemicals into our air, which damage our planet and the air surrounding us. What are two things that never run out or go away? The sun and the wind. Here on Earth, we have unlimited sunlight and wind. These are two sustainable sources of energy because they can last and using their energy doesn't do harm to our planet. The sun. We already know that the sun can do a great job of warming us up and helping plants grow. This is a form of energy. So instead of using oil or coal to produce energy, scientists have figured out a way to use the sun's energy to help make our technology work. You might have seen these before. They are most commonly found in rooftops of a building. These solar panels help take the sun's energy and convert it into electricity. The wind. A wind turbine works the opposite of a fan. Instead of using electricity to turn the blades to make wind, it uses the wind to turn the blades to make electricity. But since not all areas of the planet are really windy, scientists put these wind turbines in places that have a lot of wind. Because without the wind, no energy will be produced with these machines. So these are just two ways in which we can convert our everlasting resources into energy without being harmful to our planet. But what else can we do as individuals to make changes in our everyday lives? Well, we're sure you've heard of recycling, but just in case you haven't, we'll go over it. Have you ever seen this symbol? This is the universal recycling symbol. Recycling is when we take approved, man-made materials and convert them into something else. Just like how there are certain resources for energy that can be reused, like the sun and wind, there were some materials that can also be reused, like glass, aluminum, plastic, paper, cardboard, and more. When we throw these items into the recycling bin, they are brought to a recycling center that will help turn these items into different things. But sometimes you can also use recyclable materials to reuse 
and make something of your own, like a craft project. And the more we reuse something, the less items we are consuming and the less energy is being used to make newer items. And also, this means less waste that will take up space on the planet that can't be recycled or composted. What is composting? Composting is using natural waste like food scraps, yard clippings, and paper towels to help plants grow. And plants bring more oxygen and healthy air into our environment. So what can we do? Remember to recycle materials and compost food waste to reduce energy. There are also other little ways we can save energy around the house. As we already talked about, we are still using lots of fossil fuels like oil, coal, and gas to power our electronics. One way we can help slow down our resources from running out is to remember to turn off lights, water, and technology when we aren't using them. Another way is to use electric cars versus gas cars since gas emissions pollute the air and pollution is no good. It smells bad, causes harm to our wildlife, and makes our sky look dark and murky. Now that you know about the little changes that can be made to our planet, we want you to think about your perfect future. Walt Disney used to think about what his ideal future would look like. He once had the idea of creating a real futuristic community with cleaner energy through his vision of Epcot. In Epcot, Walt Disney wanted to build an ideal, efficient community. Part of this meant public transportation for all of its citizens. For example, his idea was to build sky rails, which look very similar to Disneyland's monorail and the people mover. The good thing about these types of transportation is that they are also more environmentally friendly since they wouldn't be using fossil fuels. Now it's your turn to draw your own. What do you want the future to look like? How will it be good for the environment? Show us your creative flair. Here's an example that my team member Natalie drew. We've talked about how Walt Disney wanted to make Epcot a community of the future. In order to do that, he had to plan out what this community would look like while also making it as efficient as he could. Today, you'll be drawing your very own city of tomorrow. And as you do that, think about what you could put into your community to make the world a better and more sustainable place. The only materials you need for this activity are paper, a pencil, and an eraser. Feel free to use other materials like markers or crayons in your drawing as well. Now let's begin. To start off, Natalie is writing down some of the things that she definitely wants to be included within her city, such as national parks, solar farms, windmills, an amusement park, and so on. While starting your drawing, we suggest creating an outline or a general shape of your city. This will give you an idea on how much room you'll have to work with. After that is drawn in, we can start figuring out how you're going to fit everything into your piece. Epcot had a central focal point in its community that everything else seemed to revolve around, so Natalie drew a center in her city. This is going to represent the downtown area, food, shopping, apartments, and businesses. Natalie's style of drawing in this piece will make some of the elements larger in certain areas to represent the different sections in her city as she continues to draw. The city plan has a top-down, bird's-eye view where all the elements are straight on facing the viewer. She's also adding rooftop gardens to the buildings with flowers, herbs, fruits, and vegetables for sustainable living. She's branching out those lines from the center all the way to the edge to create some roadways with hubs that lead in and out of the city. This also helps to section out areas within the space so that she can add in all her other ideas. 
In this section, Natalie is focusing on agriculture, which means this area will be filled with hills, fields, and mountains. Agriculture is very important. It serves as the backbone of our economy and is the practice of farming and growing crops, which provides most of the world's food, along with other resources like cotton, wheat, and wool. Along with that, she added some windmills on the hills. They are used as a source of wind energy to pump water and grind grains. The mountains and hills have a three-dimensional feel to them, which you can also do through the use of color, shading, and highlights. The fields are drawn in a bird's eye view. That is why you will see the fields sectioned off and they will have a more two-dimensional flat feel. Moving downward, this section is for the national parks. What is a national park? A national park is an area that is protected by the government for conservation, protecting the natural environment and the wildlife that live there. Natalie included things you would find in the forest, like trees, boulders, rivers, and wildlife, like the grizzly bear and the coyote. The cliff edge is closer to the border of the section while the boulder is farther away, creating the overlap, which makes it pop out and seem three-dimensional. Fun fact, the Walt Disney Family Museum is actually located in a national park in the Presidio of San Francisco. In this next section, Natalie used this space for two purposes. One side is for renewable energy with solar farms and wind turbines which power her city. Solar farms harness energy from the sun, while wind turbines convert wind energy into electricity. She purposely placed these areas next to each other on the edge of the city because they are usually in wide, open areas. The other side is for housing for the people of Natalie City to live in, including neighborhoods, parks, and schools. She drew in blocks for these areas so that it would be easy to figure out where the different areas were going to be placed. Natalie's favorite part about this city is the amusement park and something she had to include. The park is the furthest from the viewer with its perspective changing slightly, so you can see the tops of the structures. This amusement park is also located on an island that you can only get to by ferry. Again, here's the finished product. Color was used as a coating tool to differentiate between the houses and the solar farms. She used flat, two-dimensional shapes to represent the neighborhoods in the area. As mentioned earlier, color, shading, and highlights can have a great effect on the look of your city and the perspective of your drawing. We encourage you to be as creative as you'd like. We hope this inspires you not only to create your own city, but to also think about how you can bring about change for the future of our planet. We hope you were able to pick up a couple of things with us today and that you can continue to help protect our planet and make it more sustainable. Have a nice day and enjoy the rest of what we have to offer for the Big Green Draw 2020, A Climate of Change. You can continue supporting the museum and these programs by becoming a member at waltdisney.org membership or donating at waltdisney.org donate.